One bite? Yes. This is a big bite. I show you. Are you serious? It's insane, right? It's nuts. Oh, God, never pay $12 for a pint. That is ridiculous. Do not do that. This $250 16-ounce A5 olive Wagyu ribeye is considered one of the best cuts of meat in the world. This is crazy. That is Holy so rich. Shoot. Very like, much like beef chocolate. One piece of Chef Nobu's famous Otoro sushi costs $17. The price is high, means the good product also, it's the good qualities, and very um, limited. A cup of this coffee will set you back $100. <laughs> oh my God. And one white truffle can cost as much as a brand new Mercedes. To try once in your life and you will understand. I'm trying to find words, you know, you don't want to just say, oh, it's so good. But just because something is expensive doesn't mean it's worth the money. This is American Wagyu. This is Japanese Wagyu. And this is crazy. Cheers, Cheers brother. So I'm actually holding legitimately the rarest steak in the entire world called Olive Wagyu. Not only is it rare, it actually beat out 182 competitors to lay claim to the title of best fat quality at the 2017 Olympics. But what does Wagyu mean? Wagyu literally translates to Japanese cow. There are four notable breeds of cattle that are native to Japan. Of those four, only one produces the special marbling associated with high-end Japanese beef. That breed is called Kuroge Washu, or Japanese black. They are uh, licking me right now. That breed has a genetic ability to take its food and instead of putting the fat on the outside, it puts it inside the, the meat. There are about 300 brands of Wagyu, including Miyazaki, Kagoshima, and the most famous of them all, Kobe. And then there's Olive Wagyu. Olive Wagyu is a brand of Wagyu that comes from cattle raised on a small Japanese island called Shadoshima that is famous for its olive oil industry. Olive Wagyu's flavor profile is unlike the others because the cattle are fed a strict diet of rice straw, barley, and toasted olive peels. There were only 2,200 head of olive Wagyu cattle harvested in 2018, and just a tiny fraction of that was exported. Like I said, this stuff is rare. But is it actually worth the hype and the steep price tag? We'll be comparing three types of beef, American Wagyu, Japanese A5 Wagyu, and A5 Olive Wagyu. To find out, I met up with Simon Kim, the owner of Coat, a Michelin-starred Korean barbecue restaurant that serves extremely high-quality Wagyu beef to put it to the test. American Wagyu is crossbred between um, Japanese and American Black Angus. So it's got a like marbling that is pretty um, awesome, but it's kind of modest. What you're looking for is much more about texture and marbling content. Mm -hmm. That's something what you, you should be looking for. It's better than that. Oh my God, man, that's crazy. Mm. What's the word? It's velvety kind of. I eat a lot of mm. beef. Mm -hmm. But if you start with this, I don't know where yeah. we're going to end up. It's literally going to melt in your mouth. It's like putting a little one ounce stick of butter in your mouth and then letting it just, you chew into it and just going to melt like an ethereal bee from God. I'm going to take a bite and kind of very excited. I think I teared up. There's just meat juice coming out all, all over the place. The juice continuously flows out. It's insane, right? It's nuts. How does it get better? It's like never ending fountain of meat juice, you know? I mean, I already talked about how it looks like butter, but I think this is actually even more buttery looking than uh, what we had previous. Are you excited or what? You think, what do you think? Are you kidding me? Look at this. Cheers, Cheers brother. All right, here we go, man, all in. This is crazy. That is so Holy rich. Shoot. It feels like somebody just coated your mouth with a piece of wax and just, uh, you're just salivating. It's great, it's wonderful. What's your take? I think this was very like, much like beef chocolate. And it's got flavor that mm. kind of continuously goes. When you chew, you don't just chew fat. You actually chew the muscle tissues as well. So super well balanced, but the fat tastes 
like gold. If I'm being honest, I don't recommend spending the money on the A5 Isle of Wagyu. The high levels of fat become a little off-putting after just a few bites. But maybe that's the point. Go with a leaner cut of Wagyu like A3 that's about $70 cheaper and put the savings in your 401k. And I grill meat every day and it's not often that I get to see something like this. So here's my normal sushi order. I get the Edame Chirashi Bowl for $30. It comes with 10 pieces of fish, including toro and uni on a bed of rice and seaweed. And then there's the super expensive kind you find at places like Nobu downtown. Now, Nobu is by no means the most expensive sushi out there, but a meal at Nobu costs about three times as much as at my favorite neighborhood restaurant. The question is, does the higher price tag mean better sushi? We're about to find out. Chef Nobu actually invited us to try some of his favorite and most expensive sushi. Let's go check it out. But first, who is Chef Nobu and why is his sushi so famous? Nobu worked at his family's lumber business until he was 17 years old. In 1966, he began his sushi career at Matsue Sushi in Tokyo. At 24, he moved to Lima, Peru to help open a Japanese restaurant there. And it was at that restaurant where he began introducing Peruvian ingredients into his Japanese cuisine. In 1978, he moved to Los Angeles. In 1987, he opened Matsuhisa, the restaurant that would change his life forever. That restaurant became a hub of Hollywood A-listers, including Robert De Niro, who was so blown away by Chef Nobu's cuisine that he asked him to open a restaurant together. In 1994, they opened Nobu in Tribeca. Now, there are over 40 Nobu restaurants and hotels around the world. But a single piece of Toro at Nobu downtown costs $17. A similar cut costs less than half that in my local neighborhood restaurant. Chef Nobu says there's a good reason for his higher prices. The price is high means the good product also, it's the good qualities and very um, limited. Chef Nobu's sushi consists primarily of three ingredients, rice, fish, and wasabi, but it's not quite that simple. The wasabi comes from Japan and is ground fresh on a shark skin grater. The rice also comes from Japan and is sweetened with monk fruit instead of sugar. We're gonna be trying four types of sushi. Lobster nigiri, toro, his famous uni cup caviar, and Nobu's personal favorite, which is by far the cheapest, golden eye snapper with lemon and sea salt. While the lobster only costs him about $20 to source, the preparation is labor intensive. The before boil, they put the stick, it makes like a, the, a, the few minutes, and the still the inside, it's like a medium rare. Do many restaurants serve lobster medium rare? I don't think so. This is soy sauce. Maybe you can try the, this piece. That piece? Yep. Thank you so much. I'm trying to find words, you know, you don't want to just say, oh, it's so good. It's so sweet, it has a little bit of a crunch to it. So you can feel the textures, mm -hmm. a lot of technique, a lot of, kind, not secret, but experience knows how to do. So these toros come from the Spain, and uh, they have the farm tuna and that we can get the year round. Nobu says a whole bluefin tuna costs about $4,000, but only 10 pounds of that can be sold as toro. That's why it's so expensive. And so this is $17 a piece. Uh, $17 a piece. There you go. One piece for you, mm -hmm. one bite. One bite? Yep. I do one bite too. Mm. This combination is bottom, have to be the perfect sushi. Mm. Oh my God, that is perfect. It <laughs> is amazing. The uni comes from the fresh waters of Hokkaido Bay and a nine ounce tray costs $150. The caviar only costs $70 for a 50 gram tin, but that's only because Nobu's purchasing power. They serve the same type of caviar at each of his restaurants. So this is a very unique sushi I create because this one, almost, we don't, you don't need any technique. Sushi rice, this is the special seaweed, put a little bit of soy sauce. 
Uni. Oh my gosh, that's so much uni. You like uni? I love uni. Then, another half caviar. You can put the wasabi on top. Also one bite, like. One bite? Yeah. You do one bite? Yeah, not, not too big, don't worry, but that same, same piece, like the total. One bite? Yes. This is a big bite. I'll show you. Are you serious? That's the best thing I've ever eaten. Yeah. This way is the best way to how to eat sushi. It's a chef's mix, eat immediately to put it in the mouth. Oh my gosh. So what's this one? It's a golden eye. It's in, from Japan. It's a very deep fish. This is kind of my, my favorite. I show you white fish. The wasabi. My process, one, two, three, four, five, Six, right? This is a piece. This one for me, and the one for you. I like to use lemon juice and the sea salt. One bite, not right. I do one bite. Mm. It's so bright, the lemon and the salt. I've never had sushi like that. Very clean flavor. Mm. Altogether, the four pieces of sushi we ate cost more than $50 at Nobu, and I was still hungry. That's too steep for me. Here's my advice. If you want to experience a high-end sushi restaurant, but want to leave us some money in your pocket, skip the expensive stuff and look for the cheaper options. High-end places like Nobu put the same amount of care into a $3 piece of golden eye snapper as they do a $17 piece of Toro. This is a $1,500 bowl of ice cream. It's garnished with black truffle dark chocolate, hibiscus champagne sauce, and edible gold. But this isn't about that. This ice cream is nearly $10 a pint. This one's $12, and this one, $20. We've come a long way from the days of Ben and & Jerry's and haagen taking center stage in the premium ice cream aisle. Innovative flavor evolutions of made-from-scratch mix-ins and ooey-gooey centers could be the culprit, but that's just one factor. So how did ice cream get so expensive? Ice cream is the most popular frozen dessert in the U.S., with the average American consuming more than 23 pounds each year. Today, the ice cream industry is worth over $61 billion globally and expected to grow another 13% over the next five years. American companies haagen and Ben & Jerry's led the way in premium ice cream since the 1960s and 70s. But since then, consumer taste buds and preferences have changed, sparking a flavor revolution of unique ingredients and lower calorie options. In 2017, healthy ice cream newcomer Halo Top rose to be the top selling pint in the U.S. with $347 million in sales, surpassing both Ben & Jerry's and haagen proving these innovative super premium concepts are real contenders. The biggest challenge that the premium ice cream market has is competition. Now there's so many. Again, if you go back 20 or 30 years, there was Ben and & Jerry's and haagen -Dazs. It was an easy choice. And the increase in competition is making key ingredients a lot more expensive. The price of milk has increased 12% nationally in 2019 alone, and vanilla has surpassed the price of silver at $600 per kilo. The other thing that's happening is ice cream companies are cleaning up their ingredients. So as a result, all the ingredient costs have gone up as well. Let's meet some of the key players in this ultra premium space, starting with a beloved New York favorite, Ample Hills, a company that makes all their ingredients from scratch and boasts being just as much a bakery as they are an ice cream factory, which they say justifies their higher price tags. So you know in Ratatouille, when the evil food critic gets a taste of the Ratatouille and gets transported back into his childhood, that's what we're doing with our ice cream. And that time machine, that's why we feel like that price is uh, worth $8.99. Yeah. In Philadelphia, Little Baby's ice cream has been a smash hit since its founding in 2011. Known for its unconventional approach to flavors, which he sometimes comes up with on a whim, like Earl Grey Sriracha. 
one night I couldn't sleep. I was up in my kitchen just fooling around making ice cream. I was creating an Earl Grey base and just as kind of a gag on myself, I squirted in some sriracha hot sauce. I threw it in the freezer and I woke up the next day and it was absolutely delicious. And this one, chocolate pomegranate and wheatgrass. And these wacky flavors have been a hit. That's pretty good? Yeah, good. <laughs> In 2018, Little Baby's $11,000 worth of seed money grew to the opening of its sixth store and over $1 million in revenue. From the outset, we've always only been interested in being different because we're not going to make a better, cheaper chocolate ice cream than haagen -Dazs. Then there's the farm-to-table brands like Jenny's Splendid Ice Creams, who works with local farmers to source ingredients and add those finishing touches to specialty mix-ins. We're working with uh, dozens of actual makers, growers, producers. It can take 100 people or more to bring one ice cream to life. So what's the most you would pay for an ultra premium pint? No more than $5. If it's good stuff, uh... I'd pay like $3 for a pint of ice cream. Probably around like $4 or $5. Probably about $10. $12 is a bit much. Oh God, never pay $12 for a pint. That is ridiculous. Do not do that. And one of the biggest drivers of the increased price of ice cream? Air, or rather, the lack thereof. All ice cream has air in it. It's really the secret ingredient. So if you hold a pint of Ample Hills or, or Jenny's or Ben and Jerry's, you can feel the difference of it because our ice cream has less air in it. There's more there there. And that, of course, costs a lot more money than selling people air. And some ice cream makers don't necessarily think it's a bad thing to have more air in your ice cream. You can put more air into ice cream, which isn't always a bad thing, um, to make it less expensive. We've also come a long way from vanilla ice cream days. Artisanal, homemade, handmade, top dollar ingredients are creating vibrant, Instagrammable trends. And some brands are hopping on board to get more than a little creative with ingredients. So what's next for ultra premium ice cream? It's hard to say if we've hit peak prices or if younger generations in particular will continue to pay top dollar. When we look at Generation Z and we look at millennials, what they want is they want something unique, they want clean labels, and they're willing to pay. I actually don't love the idea that our ice cream is, is, is expensive. The last thing that I want to do is be known for, you know, the you know, $25 pint of ice cream or, or, or whatever. To me, that's almost a gimmick in itself. So whether it's freshly baked mixins or one-of-a-kind concoctions, the demand for ultra-premium ice cream doesn't seem to be backing down anytime soon. We're gonna see more limited edition flavors that come out maybe just for three or four months and then they disappear. So ice cream is hot and it's gonna continue to get even better. All right, so now we got a slurp. All right, really loud slurp. Okay. What's the most you'd pay for a cup of coffee? $2, $5, $18? Mike Perry, owner of Coffee Roastery Clatch Coffee out of Southern California, thinks coffee snobs like me will shell out a cool $100 for a cup of the highest rated coffee in the world. Oh my God! And no, it is not the cat poop kind. It's called Alita Geisha Natural 1029. There are only 100 pounds of it in the world, and it sold for the highest ever price at auction for a record-setting $1,029 a pound, hence its name. But before we can fully appreciate Alita Geisha 1029 and wrap our heads around its astronomical price tag, we need to figure out how coffee got to be so expensive in the first place. Coffee's transformation from afterthought to $100 a cup happened in three waves. The first wave started back in the 1800s and was all about convenience. Think Folgers and Maxwell House. The second wave started in the late 1960s and centered on coffee as a source of enjoyment. It saw the rise of darker roasts and giant coffee brands like Pete's Coffee, Caribou Coffee, and of course, Starbucks. The third wave was all about specialty coffee, putting variety, origin, and flavor notes front and center. Third wave coffee shops like Blue Bottle, Intelligentsia, and Stumptown serve lighter roasts which help bring out the unique flavor notes of each different type of coffee. But Perry says the Alita Geisha 1029's flavor profile is so extreme, it could be considered the beginning of a fourth wave of coffee. God damn. Now, Alita Geisha 1029 has a really interesting backstory. 
Geisha coffee beans originally come from Ethiopia and were actually planted in Panama as a way to combat a fungus that was ravaging coffee trees in the late 1990s. When it would attack the tree, it would basically stop it from producing cherries. So the farmers were looking for ways to compound that or to, to offset it. And they heard there was this variety from Ethiopia that was at a research center in Costa Rica. Coffee beans are the dried seeds inside of the fruit coffee growers call cherries. Geisha seeds were planted at several farms, but there was a problem. The disease-resistant trees only produced about half as many cherries as a normal coffee tree. And at the time, coffee growers in Panama were more focused on quantity over quality, so many of the farmers abandoned the geisha variety altogether. But one grower named Daniel Peterson decided to stick with it. And when he tasted the coffee from the geisha beans, he was so impressed, he entered it into the inaugural Best of Panama coffee competition in 2003, pitting it against some of the best growers from around the world. And he won. Geisha took first place that year and sold afterward at auction for $13 a pound, which Perry says was a world record at the time. That got the attention of other growers in Panama who started to produce and enter their own versions of the specialty coffee. A Geisha variety won the next year, and again, and again, each time setting a new world record for the price of a pound of coffee. In 2006, the price of a pound of Geisha reached $130. The computers froze. They never imagined they would get $100 a pound. <laughs> Fast forward to 2019, when the Alita Geisha Natural 1029 was not only the highest scoring coffee in the history of the competition, but it sold for a mind-blowing $1,029 a pound. In order to purchase the coffee at auction, Perry assembled a group of buyers from Europe and Asia who pooled their money and were able to secure all 100 pounds of the unroasted beans. For comparison, Starbucks says the company bought nearly 650 million pounds of coffee last year. There are only 1,600 cups of Alita Geisha Natural 1029 in the entire world. That's because coffee beans lose about 20% of their weight during the roasting process. So the 100 pounds is actually reduced to 80 once the beans are roasted, and each pound yields about 20 cups of coffee. Here in the U.S., we got 10 pounds. So less than, call it about 160 cups. Uh, for everybody, and you were lucky enough to be one of them to enjoy. But there's another major contributing factor to Alita Geisha's ridiculous price, the way it's processed. Most coffees are processed in one of two ways. Washed, which means the skin and pulp is removed from the cherry and the seeds are washed with water and left to dry. This process produces a clean, acidic, bright cup of coffee. The second way is called a natural process, where the cherries are picked from the tree, spread out in a single layer, and left to dry as is. This produces a fruity cup of coffee. Think blueberries and cherries. But the intense flavor profile of this year's winning variety, grown by the Lamastis family estates in Boquete, Panama, comes from the unique way the beans are processed, which it borrowed from the wine industry called anaerobic slow dry. The cherries are actually fermented in a sealed 55-gallon drum that's filled with water and left for five days. The resulting gases escape through a hose, keeping the cherries in an airtight environment. Those cherries are then laid out in the shade and dried for 60 days. While washed and natural varieties of geisha have fared well in competitions, it's the anaerobic slow-dry method that gives Elita Geisha Natural 1029 its otherworldly flavors. Yeah. I've never smelled anything like that. It's, it's kind of candied, like a candied orange, a candied lifesaver. I, I think of the Jolly Rancher Green Watermelon. Platt sent me $100 worth of beans, which came to 18 grams. And I'm meeting up with Pour Over Champion T. Benjamin Fisher at Partners Coffee in Williamsburg, Brooklyn to put it up against a couple of well-respected coffees to see if Elita Geisha 1029 is worth the money. I think what Starbucks does such a good job at is making some coffees really, really approachable. So they're gonna taste really good with some cream, with some sugar. They're gonna have a lot of like those darker, like earthy tones, those chocolate notes, some of those more nutty flavors. Like you get some of these like delicate fruit notes and it's not like crazy fruity, it's still pretty mellow. I've had some crazy fruity coffee, like I've had coffee to the point where you try it and you're like, oh, I can't believe that's uh, real. Yeah. This does not hit that. All right, but like I'm ready to get into some crazy stuff. What's next? This is like almost like the gateway drug, if you will, for like specialty, like higher grade specialties. Like Ethiopian coffees just like start to show you what coffee can, can yeah. be. Put your nose right in oh, there. Oh, I like how you're like. Yeah, just right. get it right in there. Or up, up close and personal. <laughs> like you're already gonna get like this orange marmalade. 
Wow. That is so much better. It's like so <laughs> juicy. So, <laughs> that is so good. Now this is, um, wow. Like the, the sweetness is candy. Like I just feel like I'm sucking on this like, I don't know, like a raspberry. But I know enough to know that it gets better. Or at least different. Different, I would say different. Cause like this, this really is, we're looking at like the top end of specialty here. Like you cannot believe, honestly, how fragrant this is. Dude, this smells like that other coffee taste. Like the entire room right now just smells like a bouquet. And I can't this believe this is a real thing. Huh. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's like a Jolly Rancher. It's exactly like a Jolly Rancher. Like the green ones. Mm -hmm. It's like Kool-Aid. This is so clean. There's like rose florals, like jasmine too, like subtle citrus notes. Like you're not spending $100 to drink a cup of coffee. You're spending $100 to like share the experience with right. somebody because you're wanna... never getting this again. Perry says the name Klatsch Coffee came from the German term Coffee Klatsch, which means to drink coffee over conversation. And I guess that's the point of Alita Geisha Natural 1029 and its $100 price tag. Now, I'm not sure I'd spend a Benjamin on a cup of coffee, but I will be talking about the experience of drinking Elite Geisha 1029 for a long, long time. There is something undeniably intoxicating about truffles. Just look at my daughter Evie's reaction. That potent smell is a major reason why truffles are so expensive. You can taste it before it hits your mouth. Exactly. This white truffle costs $3,800. Now, I'll shell out $15 for some truffle fries, but I just can't wrap my head around why in 2019, someone paid over $130,000 for just over two pounds of white truffles. White truffles are by far the most expensive of the kind that we eat. At the low end is summer black, then winter black, and then there's white truffle. I am super skeptical that a mushroom could cost that much money. It'd be yes, worth it. You need it. to try. You need to try once in your life and you will understand. This is Francesca. She and her partner Marco own a boutique truffle supplier called Done For New York. They have a network of about 200 truffle hunters spread throughout Italy and France who supply them with up to 400 pounds of truffles a week. Truffle hunting is also incredibly competitive. These truffle hunters wake up at ungodly hours to forage through public land with specially trained dogs, and they protect them with their lives. Truffle hunters hide their cars, they walk for miles to ensure they aren't followed, and keep their favorite spots a secret, even from family members. Not yeah. even to your sister. The truffles are then shipped overnight to JFK International Airport. Once the shipment gets through customs, the truffles are sorted and distributed to restaurants throughout the city. In just 36 hours, the truffles go from in the ground to on a plate. All truffles used in cuisine are expensive for good reason. No matter the variety, the high demand and limited quantity creates scarcity. But white truffles are incredibly expensive. That's because scientists have found ways to cultivate summer and winter black truffles. The increased supply brings down the price. And in the wild, those varieties have longer growing seasons and tend to grow in shallow soil, making them easier to find. Plus, these black truffle varieties grow a thick outer layer, which helps protect them during transport. White truffles grow much deeper in the earth, have the shortest growing season and no protective layer. But most importantly, they are impossible to cultivate. White truffles only grow in very specific parts of Europe. But when it comes to eating them, the differences become really apparent. It's so satisfying. Yeah, I know. Francesca says black truffles are all about flavor, while white truffles are all about smell. They are found from the animal of the forest because of the smell. Mm -hmm. And we appreciate them on our table because of the smell. There's a scientific explanation behind why many people like my daughter Evie react to truffles the way they do. Uh, I wish my kids behaved like that because my kids tend to recoil when I feed them truffles. That's Paul, a truffle scientist who says there's an evolutionary explanation for truffle's strong smell. So most mushrooms you see above ground, they drop the spores, the wind will pick the spores up, and they'll be blown around or they'll be spread by insects. But truffles form below ground and they have to be eaten and pass through a digestive tract to, to continue on that part of the life cycle. So they, so they want to entice us. In fact, 
He says the aroma of truffles, but especially white truffles, is physically intoxicating, kind of like cannabis. There's uh, endocannabinoids in, in truffles, which you might be surprised to hear. There's uh, one called anadamine, which, um, which has similar, although lesser effects to THC in cannabis. So it will make you feel more relaxed. It will make food and things more, uh, more appetizing. Well, now that I know I may have given my toddler a buzz, it's time to see what one of the most expensive foods in the world is all about. So I met up with Chef Pierre, who runs the kitchen at the Marc restaurant by Jean Georges inside the five-star The Marc Hotel. And we're going to put more truffle on top, of course. He's preparing us his most popular truffle dishes so we can determine if white truffles are actually worth the money. Well, so black truffle people are pretty familiar with, but like we're here to talk about white truffles. To try some black first and okay. I'll move to the white. Okay. Pizza. Oh my gosh, truffle pizza sounds ridiculous. Yeah. How much is this pizza? $39. $39? But if you put another couple of grams, yeah. it's another $15 go on the top. Oh, so every gram of truffle you want to add is another $15. Yeah. Wow. This is good. Little uh, white truffle pasta. Okay, now, now we're getting to the real thing. Yeah. Like this is a celebration of white truffle. Oh, big time. this one is the, the because yeah. white truffle you cannot cook, so the only way to appreciate is an aroma. And you know, in these food shows, they tell you like, oh, you're supposed to take the smallest bites ever, and oh, I, I always just go the, full the in. Big... I can't. I think the black truffle's stronger. I feel like it was. It, oh yeah. It, I feel like it had more of a of a bigger flavor. It's easy to mistake big flavors for expensive. Exactly. So we saved your favorite, the best for last. We tried white truffle with like just the pasta, nothing to hide behind. No. This is like juiced up a little bit. We have a mayo lemon risotto and uh, with lobster. Mm -hmm. So they bring up a notch. Mm -hmm. And of course the, the fresh uh, the white truffle, truffle on top. Mm. It's good. It's so delicate. Yeah. Of a flavor. I kind of think that I would, everyone don't need the truffle on this dish. This is just good. No, it's a good dish by mm -hmm. himself. But you know, you want a little luxury to the, to your plate, it's pretty good. It's an aroma, the white truffle. That's that's mm -hmm. the first thing you have to think about. It's not going to give you like the black truffle, you know, you know, like yeah. earthiness, and yeah, it's yeah. a completely different ball game. It's a totally different thing. Yeah, it's different. My advice: if you want to get the most for your money, skip the white truffle altogether. Do this instead. Get a small winter black like this one from Done for New York. Wrap it in a paper towel and put it and some eggs in a sealed container and put that container in your fridge overnight. The truffle will permeate the shells infusing the eggs with truffle essence. Make an omelet with those eggs and I swear, you'll be eating better than most of the country for less than the price of breakfast for two at Denny's. Wrap the truffle up in a new paper towel and repeat. It should stay good for about a week and by then you'll have had your fill of truffle for a long, long time.